Welcome to Japan House. It is great to have you here on a Friday. We finally have beautiful weather, which I think is thanks to all of you. It's been like London the last couple of days. No disrespect to those of you from London. Uh, the rain has been a little bit depressing, but I can't think of a better place, a place I would rather be than where we are today. Many of you were here last night. It feels kind of like a family gathering in more ways than one with the, uh, the, the Getter Yellen clan uh, here in the house, and I want to thank each of you for being here. Um, you see who I'm supposed to thank. If I try to go through all the list of those things, so you're gonna say that I thanked every one of these sponsors and all of you that made uh, today uh, possible. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna spare you and let you read that uh, in different ways. Um, but I just wanna kind of put the, the imprint of Japan Society and just say thank you uh, to Kurt and Alice, who you're gonna hear from a little bit later on today. And I'm really excited about this conversation because I think that often uh, you know, th those of us that have the privilege to be at institutions like this and many of the institutions represented in this room, um, you don't get to hear the collector's side. How did it come to be? And as you walk through the exhibit and you think about uh, the, the beautiful way it was laid out, the thought that went behind the cura curation and the many curators you're gonna hear from today as well, you don't get the full story, the full package. That's what today is really about. It's an opportunity to bring it all together, to literally come full circle uh, in this project and this opportunity. Uh, and I just wanna say thank you to Kurt and Alice for their confidence in us to bring this together. There are many places that this show has and will go, uh, and this collection has, and been before, including at Japan Society many years ago, but to have it back, it feels particularly timely. As I said yesterday at the opening, uh, the world, not just because of the dark weather we've had and the winter that we're coming out of, it feels a bit broken. Uh, and as I go through and look at some of the playfulness of Hakuin and think about some of the way that the, 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 the Yuki Daruma speak to me in different ways, the snowmen uh, speak to me. I didn't know until today actually that Daruma comes from Dharma. I did, had no idea. I uh, just grew up in Japan and I just assumed there were other meanings there. So I feel like every time I've walked through and seen uh, the, the, the paintings, the koans, the other pieces, there's so much we can learn. And I am uh, so excited today to be able to be in the presence of the true experts uh, and to be able to learn. But before we get to the main event and kind of uh, being able to really learn uh, from Professor Lippitt, who we're excited to hear from, I want to introduce our newest member at Japan Society, someone that we've all been excited about in some ways uh, has come full circle here as well. So I want to introduce our new uh, gallery director, Dr. Michelle Bambling, to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight and just say thank you uh, for all of you being here. Michelle-san. Thank you for that kind introduction. Good morning, welcome everyone. And uh, we're still in the glow of last night's experience of the sublime opening. I want to thank Ellis Yell and Gitter and Kurt Gitter very much for making this possible. And to reiterate Joshua's thanks to all of our sponsors with whom it would be impossible to do this and we're deeply grateful. Before we get started, and we have a lot to say today, I wanted to set the tone that this is an informal conversation today, and it's really a way of delving deeper into what we were able to experience last night, and to encourage you all to go back into the galleries following the talk. So in terms of the program today, we're going to begin with the keynote, and the keynote will be delivered by Dr. Yukio Libet, who is the Jeffrey T. Chamber and Andrea Okamura Professor of the History of Art and Architecture at Harvard University. He's also one of the curators of this exhibition. And Yukio Lippet will give us a talk called Zenga, A New History, and that will be our keynote kickoff talk. That will be followed by welcoming Alice and Kurt to the stage in an informal conversation titled Collecting Japanese Art, Journey of a Lifetime. And Akio Lippet and myself will join them and we will look at the genesis of their collection, the development of it, their aims, and that will end the beginning of today's program. So that sets the tone and the pace for uh, the background of what we will continue after our tea break with omochi and with uh, some osembe. And we will begin our second half with a round table. And the round table speakers I will introduce at that time, but the gist of the round table will be what happens after the collection was formed. And that is the legacies, the institutional legacies in universities and in museums of this fabulous collection. And it's importance. So thank you very much. I would like to welcome Dr. Lippitt to the stage, please. Thank you. I wanted to thank uh, Joshua Walker, Michelle Bambling, uh, my co-curator for the show, Bradley Bailey, uh, the person who really is responsible for the remarkable, beautiful installation, uh, Tiffany Lambert, 
our, um, everyone at the Japan Society. It's a real privilege to work with the Japan Society on this. And of course, I want to extend uh, deepest possible appreciation to uh, Kurt and Alice uh, for making all of this possible, for allowing me to work with them. Let me begin my lecture. Everyone, and I mean everyone I've spoken to, family, friends, colleagues, have begged me not to do what I'm about to do, which is to begin this presentation with a joke. <laughs> it's a well-known joke about Zen Buddhism. Perhaps you heard of it. It goes something like this. A Zen monk approaches a hot dog vendor in Central Park and says, make me one with everything. I have in my notes here a pause for laughter, so. <laughs> Wait, there's more. The Zen monk hands the vendor a $20 bill and asks for change, to which the vendor replies, all change comes from within. <laughs> the joke is in homage to Kurt Gitter because, and I say this with the most, utmost admiration and affection, Kurt is both intentionally and unintentionally funny. But humor is, is also crucial to the teachings of Zen Buddhism. Because it embodies wordless communication, the ability to elicit laughter, and when one laughs, it's a manifestation of a kind of unfiltered eruption of the true self. In my mind, humor also characterizes the most important dialogue in the myth history of Zen Buddhism, one that led to the title of the exhibition that is opening here today. It's a remarkable dialogue that's at the center of uh, Zen Buddhist history and mythology, something like the ultimate Zen conversation. Now, according to tradition, Bodhidharma, known as Daruma in the Japanese tradition, is an Indian monk who travels to China and spreads Zen teachings, thereby becoming the first Zen patriarch of Buddhism. Bodhidharma, or Daruma, visited the emperor, uh, Chinese Emperor Wu around the year 520, and Emperor Wu, was a prominent patron of Buddhism and surely awaited this visit of an eminent monk with great eagerness. So one version of their encounter reads as follows, and you can see this on the screen. Emperor Wu says, I've built many temples. I've copied innumerable sutras and ordained many monks since becoming emperor. Therefore, I ask you, what is my merit? To which the Bodhidharma famously replies, none whatsoever. Things are getting a little bit uncomfortable now in, at court. Emperor Wu asks, he's flummoxed, he asks, why no merit? To which Bodhidharma replies, doing things for merit has an impure motive and will only bear the puny fruit of rebirth. To which Bo uh, Emperor Wu then asks, okay then, what is the most important principle of Buddhism? Bodhidharma replies, vast emptiness, nothing sacred. Emperor Wu, who is this then who stands before me? Bodhidharma, I do not know. Now you have to feel for Emperor Wu. He came into the meeting with high expectations. He'd done a lot, donated lavishly to Buddhist causes. And as a result, how much karmic advancement had he achieved? In the end, how much spiritual equity had he accrued? Well, you know the answer, none whatsoever. Now this exchange in all of its mystery and opacity, in all of its theater of the absurd, serves as a good starting point for my discussion today of the tradition that we call Zenga, literally Zen painting, and the exhibition of the Gitter Yellen Collection, which is the most important private collection of Zenga outside of Japan, and one that's played a key role in shaping our understanding of this artistic genre. Now the conversation between Daruma and Emperor Wu showcases the most important theme in Zen Buddhist teaching, and by extension, Zenga painting, the necessity of looking within oneself to find the Buddha nature, that is to say, the seed of enlightenment that's latent within every sentient being, Instead of acts of patronage and other external doings of the kind which Emperor Wu was involved, the key is to perceive this inner source of potential uh, salvation. This is harder than one might think because our own minds, our own consciousness in general, is diluted by our senses. Another way of saying this, that our, our, our pure mind or our pure self has been obscured by our own senses, which are the result of the karma of our previous lives. So the challenge is to recover the pure state of our mind or our true self, what in Japanese is referred to as shin or kokoro. Okay. And that's the primary teaching of the Bodhidharma or Daruma, to find one's own kokoro 
or pure mind and constantly to keep that in mind in order to eventually find one's way towards enlightenment. And that's the reason why Daruma is one of the most important subjects of Zenga and is one of the first, uh, one of the works you'll see in the first room as you enter this exhibition. This work is one of the most important, is by one of the most important monk painters of the Zenga tradition, Hakuin Ekaku. Now Hakuin's Daruma painting is quite famous and embodies many of the characteristics that make his work so appealing. Uh, it's direct, it's bold, it's gestural and communicative, but it's also idiosyncratic. It's also folkic, even comical. Um, it appears to be looking up at the inscription, which you, as you can see here states, point directly to your mind and see your Buddha nature. Okay. And the character Kokoro, which is a four stroke character in Japanese that you see down below, is actually embedded in the very body of the Daruma as if to underscore this message. And this is why Daruma is a kind of protagonist of the entire exhibition. You'll see many portraits of Daruma in many guises by many artists and all convey the same message to look within. And by and large, this is the most important theme, again, of Zenga painting. Now, the term Zenga, again, literally Zen painting, designates paintings and calligraphies by ordained Japanese monks active during the Edo period through the modern era. For the most part, Zenga works render deities and patriarchs from the Zen Buddhist pantheon or inscriptions of Zen sayings in ways that are direct, bold, uh, gestural, and communicative. But they can also depict um, popular deities, uh, elements of popular culture, and allegorical paintings reflecting Zen teachings. As an art historical category, however, Zenga is a fairly recent vintage, having become widespread only in the post-war era. As such, its place within histories of Japanese culture remains ambiguous. Uh, this unsettledness stems from the fact that in Japan itself, Zenga painters were viewed as amateur artists. They lacked professional training and were therefore by and large excluded from the art historical canon. Indeed, the Japanese government has a, a, a robust system for designating its own cultural patrimony according to a hierarchy of importance. So uh, buildings or works of art can be designated national treasures or important cultural properties or important art objects. Until recently, no Zenga works had ever been conferred any one of these categories, and that's a point I'll return to later on. Rather, Zenga was only truly conceived as a category or tradition of art making in the post-war West. Accordingly, in my time today at the podium, I'd like to first address the conditions under which the Zenga tradition was recognized as such and came to be collected. Before exploring some of the historical circumstances of the monk painters, most notably that of Hakuin Ekaku. And in doing so, I'm gonna be working backwards chronologically and addressing first the emergence of Zenga as an artistic category in the modern era, then the formation of a Zenga canon, and finally considering some of the most salient visual qualities of uh, Edo period monk painters. So to understand the art world space occupied by Zenga today, it's fruitful to trace the rise of Zenga as a phenomenon in the West, in Europe in particular, during the 50s and 60s. As a term, in fact, Zenga was coined by a German businessman named Kurt Brash on the occasion of Malarai des Zen Buddhismus in Japan, which is a major exhibition of Edo period Zen monk painters that toured Europe in 1959-1960. And by all accounts, this exhibition was a major success and established a broad foundation for Zenga's popularity in the West and it spurred a veritable Zenga boom. If you can believe it, a total of 24 venues uh, for uh, exhibitions of Zenga were put on display between the years 1959 and 1965. Here I'm listing a few of the most prominent ones. Uh, uh, and the picture is actually from the 1963 venue at the Petit Palais in Paris which is notable because it was organized through the initiative of Andre Malraux, the famous French novelist and at the time Minister of Culture. Brash, Kurt Brash, was clearly the figure most responsible for initiating the Zenga boom in Europe. And his publications included a German one titled Zenga that appeared soon after the European traveling show. And in fact, his Japanese book Zenga from 1962 remains influential to this day. Now, numerous commentators have addressed the historical and ideological reasons for the popularity of Zenga as a category of Japanese painting in the post-war West. 
the Cold War provided a favorable ideological framework for cultural exchange between Japan and the West. The writings of D.T. Suzuki were crucial, not only in the popularization of Zen Buddhism in English, but also Zen's reformulation as a modern tr uh, religion that could be articulated in terms of psychology, in terms of the language of psychology. And the rise of abstract expressionism allowed the visual qualities of paintings and calligraphies by Zen painters to be conceptualized as modern and abstract. So the convergence of these developments were crucial to the establishment embrace of Zenga as a Japanese tradition. But it is also the case that several of the artists that would become associated with Zenga later on, as well as its canon, were already well established among collectors and cultural figures in Japan during the early decades of the 20th century. And it's their embrace of Edo monk painters, such as Hakuin and Sengai, two artists that are featured in the show, that can be understood as filling a spiritual void that emerged with Japan's transition to modernity. So for these figures of the early 20th century, uh, Zen was a form of kind of therapeutic spiritualism. And it was especially, uh, especially as it was understood through the teachings of a figure named Shaku Soeng, a Meiji era abbot of Engakuji Monastery in Kam Kamakura. He's the figure you see on the screen here. Soen may be best known today as the teacher of DT Suzuki, but it was Soen's lecture at the World's Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893 that actually rep represents the first ever explanation of Zen Buddhism in English. And uh, furthermore, Soen himself was an accomplished painter and calligrapher who used the brush arts to convey his teachings and mediate his relationships with monks and patrons. And I should, I'm showing you here a work by Soen that's in the exhibition. And I, I really should, uh, we should credit the Gitter Yellen collection for being one of the first collections anywhere to really understand and feature Shak Soen's work as a painter. Most importantly though, Soen's activities provide an important framework within which to understand the rise of J Japanese interest in Zen, Zenga in the modern era. Because it was in the decades after Soen established himself as abbot at Engakuji that witnessed the assemblage of the earliest collections of Hakuin and Sengai in the world, but in Japan, mostly by prominent uh, industrialists and cultural figures such as Horikawa Moritatsu, who you see on the left, who amassed a famous collection of 1,000 Hakuin that formed the basis of what's now known as the Eisei Bunko Museum in Tokyo. And on the right, Idemitsu Sazo, who'd end up amassing a famous collection of Sengai's uh, works, now part of the Idemitsu Museum in, in Tokyo. It's worth considering at greater length why Hakuin and Sengai, these two monks in particular, garnered so much admiration and became the central figures around which the Zenga canon would later be formed. Although Zenga was an artistic category that responded to modern concerns, as we've seen, it was ultimately the qualities of Hakuin's and Sengai's works that had enabled it to do so in such a direct manner. So let me say a few words about Hakuin Ekaku. He is commonly understood as the figure most uh, responsible for leading the revival of Zen, in particular of Dinzai school Zen during the Edo period, suggesting the extent of his fame and influence. And his writings include texts that are still extensively studied today, and his reform of Zen training has influenced the methods by which contemporary monks train in Dinzai monasteries. Painting and calligraphy paid an important role in the propagation of Hakuin's teachings, and he's estimated to have created some 10,000 paintings and calligraphies from his, 90, from his 40s onward, he's a late bloomer, of which around 5,000 survive. The subject matter of this corpus is wide ranging. It includes Buddhist deities, Zen patriarchs, Shinto kami, folk deities, historical figures, uh, as well as landscapes, animals, Zen uh, implements, and a lot of allegorical works. One of the most notable aspects of Hakuin's biography was that he was born in a small town, the station of Hara, Hara Juku, Hara Shuku, what is today the city of Numazu in Shizuoka Prefecture. It's about 130 kilometers from Edo. It's close to Mount Fuji, and mostly uh, Hakuin settled there his whole life. In fact, he became the abbot of Shoinji Temple nearby, and it's somewhat of a mystery how this abbot of this obscure regional temple came to achieve such fame. It has something to do with its proximity to the Tokaido Highway, 
which is a busy transit which connected uh, East and Western Japan and the main island. Uh, Hakuin did indeed travel far and wide, but it was also the case that the world came to him through the Tokaido Highway. And in fact, in recent years, it's been interesting, uh, it's been come to be increasingly recognized just how much the Tokaido Highway is a theme in many of Hakuin's works. In fact, uh, some of his works parody the daimyo processions that march back and forth east and west on the highway. We've learned a great deal more about Hakuin's life and circumstances over the past 15 years or so. And it's now clear that Hakuin's embrace of the brush arts can be attributed to the convergence of several historical factors, and I'm gonna list them here for you. The first is the expanding influence of what's known as Obaku Zen. It's a school of Zen Buddhism that originates in southeastern China during Hakuin's lifetime. Uh, although the Obaku sect arrived in Japan well before Hakuin's birth. It, it arrives with the emigration of a monk named Yin Yuan Long Chi in 1654. Actually, its religious and cultural influence unfolded over many decades, uh, especially in regions beyond Japan's urban center. So it's really spreading and coming to, a, coming to the fore during Hakuin's lifetime. Now, the presence of Obaku Zen in Japan shaped Hakuin's religious outlook and artistic practice in at least two important ways. The first was its role in exacerbating the perception that Japan's traditional Zen establishment was in decline. Because Obaku, the Chinese sect, hailed from the same Dinzai Zen tradition as what was in Japan, it was viewed as, by some as representing a more authentic transmission of this lineage than claimed by Japan's Dinzai Zen communities. Indeed, during the 18th century, the most prestigious Dinzai monasteries in Kyoto appear to have been experiencing a crisis of legitimacy. Another way in which the presence of Obaku Zen shaped uh, Hakuin's activities was in terms of cultural practice. Uh, many of Hakuin's earliest surviving calligraphies, which mostly date to his late 40s and early 50s, are now understood to reflect in some way or another the influence of Obaku Zen models. And I'm just showing you an example here of this very, really remarkable uh, calligraphic scroll in the first room. It's titled Longevity because it showcases the character Kotobuki and it shows uh, 100 different uh, ways of, of writing the same character Kotobuki in different calligraphic scripts. It's kind of a virtuosic showcase of calligraphy, but that comes from an obaku pattern uh, 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 type of, of calligraphic work. A second factor shaping Hakuin's religious and artistic output was actually the inexorable spread of print culture during the 18th century, which enabled the dissemination of Hakuin's teachings through published lectures and writings. Indeed, Hakuin often delivered lectures, known as teisho, on his own publications, okay, presupposing a knowledge of his writings among his audience. And print culture also played a subtle role in the evolution of the monk painter's artistry. He was a late blooming painter who began creating pictures in earnest from his, uh, well, he began painting from his 40s onwards, but he really began painting lots of works from his 60s onwards. And um, he never had the benefit of formal training. So Hakuin appears to have taken pains to find sources and models from illustrated books. And this sourcing is reflected, for example, in uh, this work, it's, it's based clearly upon a pictorial model in, of a very popular uh, painting manual that was circulating at the time by Ooka Shunboku called A Garden of Celebrated Chinese and Japanese Paintings, Wakam Mega Eng. Furthermore, Hakuin's paintings reflect an awareness of the strategies of playful framing and juxtaposition, and also the black backgrounds employed by contemporary print designers such as Suzuki Harunobu. As such, uh, resonances strongly suggest Hakuin Zenga participated in a kind of urban visual culture of the mid-Edo period far more than previously assumed. Now, a third historical factor inflecting Hakuin's artistic output was the monk's relationship to social protest during the 18th century. Over the course of the monk's long career, the corruption of daimyo lords and other Tokugawa elites gave rise to inc increasingly widespread anger among commoners. This corruption is addressed directly in one of Hakuin's sermons titled Raspberries, Hebi Ichigo, which was published in 1754 and takes the form of a letter addressed to the lord of Okayama domain. His name is Ikeda Tsugumasa. And indeed, the book, Raspberries, Hebi Ichigo, is actually banned by the Tokugawa authorities. 
This criticism isn't isolated. A recent study by the uh, historian Takahashi Satoshi highlights the degree to which the corruption of the ruling elite was addressed both directly and indirectly in Hakuin's lectures and writings. Takahashi painstakingly demonstrates the ways in which Hakuin was involved in social protest movements of his day, including his remarkable role in a peasant uprising, Hyakusho uh, Ikki, during the mid to, uh, early to mid 1760s in the Ojima domain near his hometown of Hara, uh, Suruga province. And I just, I just wanna explain a little bit the images on here because they reflect Takahashi Satoshi's uh, kind of methodology. There's no documentation of his involvement in social protests, but Takahashi travels around local regional temples. And he notes that Hakuin's calligraphy graces a lot of the plaques of many temples. And he checked the registries of those temples and found that some of Hakuin's lectures were attended by people who were involved in the social protest movement. It's kind of mixed and matched various data sets to uh, make this conclusion. Indeed, the populism of Hakuin's Zen teachings was charged by the immediacy and urgency with which it addressed contemporary social justice. And in some ways, his rise is more akin to the phenomenon of new Tokugawa popular religions, such as Shingaku, than it is to traditional Zen Buddhism. So in this way, the impact of Obaku Zen, of print culture, and of social protest mo movements converged to shape Hakuin's approach to and use of the brush arts. Now in visual and thematic terms, uh, how did Hakuin's paintings differ from traditional paintings of Zen subject matter of the Muromachi period? Well, there are a number of ways to answer this question. The first is to observe that while Hakuin perpetuated many of the painting subjects of the Zen canon, in particular Zen patriarchs and eccentrics, he portrayed them with exaggerated features uh, that rendered them akin to folk art. A good example is giant Daruma witnessed earlier. Now, bust portraits of Daruma were common in medieval Japan and followed an established pattern in which the Indian patriarch was uh, rendered mostly in three-quarter profile with abbreviated brushwork and bulging eyes. And details such as large ears and an abundance of facial and body hair were also common. Hakuin's portrayal includes all of the elements of this template but renders them with greater exaggeration and intensity. Secondly, Hakuin's paintings tend to position traditional Zen figures in novel situations. In this regard, a favorite subject of his was Hote, the portly Chinese Zen priest who's prone to wander the villages of the Jiangnan region in China, clothed as a vagabond, carrying all of his possessions in a burlap sack hanging from a pole. In fact, the, the, the name Hote means burlap sack. Although traditional paintings of Hote rendered the figure in a relatively limited number of guises, Hakui mobilized the priest in ways that were unprecedented. Take, for example, running Hote in the Getter Yellen collection. It's a work that you'll see as soon as you enter the first room and you turn left. Here we see the priest running at full spring, sprint, but instead of his familiar sack, he's carrying a large mallet, which is mentioned in the accompanying inscription here. What a heavy mallet, it'll be the death of me. Because a mallet's used to pound rice, it's a symbol of wealth. So the inscription appears to be commenting on the uncertain spiritual results of blindly racing to accumulate wealth. Here, Hote has been cast as a stand-in for an urban commoner with secular concerns, a kind of everyman embodying worldly goals. Uh, the scholar Yoshizawa Katsuhiro likens Hote to an action hero dynamically embodying religious teachings in Hakuin's Zen world. Thirdly, Hakuin greatly expanded the traditional repertoire of Zen painting and calligraphy to include all kinds of popular themes, Confucian maxims, and auspicious subjects that appealed to the sensibilities of commoners or people who otherwise had no real interest in Zen Buddhist teachings. A good example from the Gitter Yellen collection is Virtue, a powerful calligraphic work that inscribes in large scale the character for virtue or toku in its bottom half. This scroll was undoubtedly intended for a merchant, a person of commerce, one of many who gathered around Hakuin as lay disciples. And the dis inscription above records a passage by the Chinese literatus Sima Guang that reads like an admonition for merchants who hope to maintain the prosperity of their family lineage. It basically says, don't bother passing, off, passing down money to your kids. They're just gonna squander it. Don't, don't accumulate books and pass them down. They're not gonna read it. What's best to pass on is virtue, secretly acquired virtue. Uh, 
there is um, absolutely nothing directly Zen Buddhist about this, but this is what I would call an outreach painting that Hakuin gives to various followers. It's, it's simply to form a connection. Maybe that will lead to something later on. Two further aspects of Hakuin's work are particularly important to understanding his innovative approach to the pictorialization of Zen themes. One's the prevalence of allegorical painting in his work. Hakuin was fond of using allegories and parables in his lectures from the podium to illustrate Buddhist truths. Hakuin uh, and many of his paintings can be understood as extensions into the visual realm of the rhetorical strategies he adopted at the podium. Blind Men Crossing a Log Bridge from the Gitter Yellen Collection embodies well this penchant. As its title suggests, this singular work depicts two blind men with staves uncertainly making their way across a bridge extending above a body of water. An inscription in the upper left reads, in both spiritual training and dealing with the world, keep in mind the example of blind men crossing a log bridge, suggesting a common metaphor of secular life as a near shore and enlightenment as a far shore separated by a large ravine. The inscription urges viewers to understand the path towards spiritual awakening as similar to that of blind men attempting to uh, really grope their way across a log bridge spanning the two shores. Now, a final distinguishing aspect of Hakuin's paintings lies in the unique nature of his inscriptions, most notably the manner in which they function both graphically and orally as what I would call uh, soundscapes. Hakuin often embeds his calligraphy in complex ways into the structure of his works, distributing his inscriptions onto different spaces and motifs within the surface, ranging from cartoon bubbles to paintings within paintings. Similarly, his texts have different voices that borrow from myriad forms of orality and seven gods of good fortune in the Gitter Yellen collection, again, this is showcased in the first room of the exhibition, offers a compelling example. Now this work depicts a traditional grouping of auspicious deities that were collectively associated with good fortune. Uh, most notable here is Shoki Jonkwe, the Chinese demon uh, queller in the center who becomes a popular Japanese deity associated with the kind of functions of warding off illness and evil spirits. And only the inclusion of Shoki here deviates from a standard grouping of seven gods of good fortune. Typically they include the warrior god Bishamunteng instead. Now it's likely that this painting includes Shoki because he was associated with New Year's. Uh, so this is a, indicating that this painting was commissioned as a gift to celebrate the start of the new year. There are two accompanying inscriptions in different spaces within the picture. One in the upper right states, if you're loyal to your Lord and filial to your parents, you'll receive all of my treasures. It's one of the deities talking about uh, his, his uh, championing the virtue of filial piety. Meanwhile, the second inscription in the lower left is, Im uh, has, uh, is embedded in the libretto spread in front of the deity known as Fukurokuju, and it reads, Shoki hides his sword under the eaves and stealthily, stealthily guards the palace. Now, in keeping with other Confucian-themed paintings and calligraphies by Hakuin, again, the first inscription is, 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 is basically about filial piety. It has nothing to do with Zen per se. The second inscription, meanwhile, emphasizes a different dimension of the New Year's picture in which Soki serves to protect the household, in this case, the palace, from evil spirits and calamity. And just as important as the graphic distribution of the inscriptions are the different modes of modalities of, of voice or utterance they embody. The words at the upper right probably can be understood as Hakuin's own voice. Uh, in, it's, it's really the voice of the deity, but, but we can call it Hakuin's own words. The one at the lower left, however, should be understood as being chanted in the lilt of a raconteur accompanying a boisterous musical ensemble. Indeed, the words are embedded in the painting. They're actually taken directly from the libretto of a no play named Shoki. But I believe that the scene could equally invoke the ebullience of a New Year's ceremonial dance at Shinto shrines, one known as uh, Kagura, uh, which also features Shoki, the demon queller, in a prominent role. And here I'd like to uh, actually just show about 30, 30 seconds of a video because uh, of a Kagura performance of Shoki because it'll really bring this painting to life and show you what uh, Hakuin is doing in incorporating popular culture into his, uh, into his painting.
uh, here, you, as you just saw, here as you see in the painting, the ensemble includes Ben Zaiten's flute, the drumming of Hote and Daikokuten, perhaps the chanting of Jurojin, along with Fukurokuju, and Shoki in the center, in the middle, dances in this kind of amusingly awkward and, and I think kind of zombie-like manner to the merriment generated by his companions. So the second inscription is totally contrastive to the first. It's, it's sung instead of said, and it's a merriment instead of an admonition. So within Hakuin's work, uh, Seven Gods of Good Fortune is not an isolated instance. In fact, the monk painter embeds many different forms of orality into his paintings, popular tunes, local dialects, vernacular phrases, uh, children's songs, and their inclusion diversifies the rhythmic profile of a work, rendering it more multisensorial and familiar to readers by invoking the idiolects of daily life. Um, it might be meaningful to grasp this concept through the literary scholar, Mikhail Bakhtin's idea of what he calls heteroglossia. According to Bakhtin, heteroglossia is this uh, world that literature evokes where it brings together many different types of speech within a single language that serves to construct a world with different values and different social perspectives reflected by these voices. In fact, it's a, it's a technique closely illustrated with the rise of the novel in general. Similarly, Hakuin evokes through his inscriptions a novel-like world, dynamic, multivocal, with different aspects of Edo society coexisting within the same picture. They manage to generate this world through an economy of means, a rich fictive world of their own, animated with Zen ideas, full of immediacy to period viewers. Now, the other uh, monk painter at the heart of the Zen canon is Sengai Gibong, who lived many generations after Hakuin and who similarly is accorded a significant role, uh, who similarly accorded a significant role to paintings and calligraphies in his work. Sengai served for many years as an abbot of Shofukuji Temple in Fukuoka. And like Hakuin, he mixed traditional Zen themes with a dizzying variety of subjects drawn from popular culture and daily life. He rendered them in highly abbreviated and purposefully awkward brushwork. Otherwise, however, his artistry is different from that of his predecessor in pretty significant ways. Whereas Hakuin's work is filled with parables and allegories and invariably strikes a serious tone, Sengai's brims with wordplay, irony, and conveys a humorous mood. In terms of pictorial style, uh, furthermore, Sengai's painting is even more abbreviated and sketchy than the former, and it lacks the intricate details and the descriptive brushwork and coloration occasionally witnessed in Hakuin's pictures. And these qualities of lightness and awkwardness are really well captured in this work, Hote Wakes from a Nap, in the Gitter Yellen collection. It play, it's a playful variation on traditional renderings of the Zen priest, uh, which usually depict him sleeping. So here he's kind of waking up. Uh, which is really poking fun at, at the Zen tradition itself. And he says, what a pleasant nap. I dreamt I was the Duke of Zhou. He's a famous Chinese statesman who was the patron of Confucius, um, the opposite of the merry mendicant that Hote is. So while Hakuin and Sengai were the unambiguous focal point of modern Zenga collections, Hakuin's predecessors and followers would be recognized as members of the Zenga school. And when determining the object list of the 1959-1960 European Zenga exhibition, Kurt Brash and his fellow organizers essentially worked backwards from Hakuin in an attempt to discern Hakuin-like traits in earlier monk painters. This phenomenon might ultimately be likened to Jorge Luis Borges' seemingly impossible proposition that Franz Kafka influenced the writers who preceded him. As Borges states, each writer creates his precursors. His work modifies our conception of the past as it will modify the future. Words that apply unerringly to the way Hakuin has shaped our understanding of cultural history before him. Uh, what you see here are all figures that are, that are now referred to as predecessors to Hakuin in the Zenga tradition, but we don't actually know if Hakuin had direct, uh, any direct study of them. We, we, it's, it's very ambiguous. Other Hakuin followers have been increasingly recognized, sorry, during the Edo period, none of Hakuin's followers ever achieved the renown of Hakuin, but they continued his practice of using painting to mediate relationships between, uh, with disciples and patrons. Perhaps two of the best known are Hakuin's immediate predecessors, 
Tode Enji, who's the author of this very uh, famous Enso on the left, that's also in the third room of the exhibition, and Suyo Gendo. Suyo Gendo is the successor to the abbotship of Hakuin's own temple, Shoinji. Other Hakuin followers have been increasingly recognized for their individualistic approaches uh, to Zenga themes and are well represented in the uh, Gitter Yellen collection. There's Degeng Eto, who's another direct disciple who served as abbot of Dokuoin Temple in Kyoto, perhaps the closest in pictorial style to Hakuin himself. And as the Edo period progresses, monks outside of the Rinzai Zen establishment similarly embraced painting as a means of manifesting Zen teachings. So Qingyu, Qingyu Zuiko, the figure you see on the right here, was a Zen monk of the Soto sect, whose work such as Monk Fuka assumes an extravagantly uh, inky approach to form. Now in recent years, art historians have expanded the category of Zenga beyond the work of monk painters by noting the influence of Hakuin and fellow monks on professional painters, in particular from the 18th century uh, Kyoto school. So it's known that Hakuin acclaimed the famous literati painter Ikeno Taiga as a disciple and exerted an influence on him at a young age. But there's a reason to believe that other painters, like the eccentric Soga Shohaku, uh, the uh, painter Maruyama Okyo, or Ito Jakchu, all of you see here, were also under the sway of Hakuin's example. And in the modern era, some monk painters working within the Hakuin tradition adapted their practices to the conditions of modern society and art viewership. So this phenomenon is most apparent in the works of Nakahara Nantembo, who's easily the most dynamic practitioner of modern Zenga and is a fiery reformer in the mold of Hakuin himself. While perpetuating many of Hakuin's themes, Nantembo expanded their, so, uh, their scale and showcased vigorous, brushy movement. Um, this, these changes were undoubtedly shaped by the changing conditions of art viewership, most notably the slow spread of public exhibition culture in modern Japan. So in Nantembo's hands, Zenga becomes much more uh, performative. And I should say that this performative aspect of Zenga, in which monks are basically performing their paintings in front of others, uh, starts with Nantembo and is really continues today. Uh, some of you may remember down below the Tofukuji abbot Fukushima Kedo, who passed away around 10 years ago, but used to travel around the United States giving such performances. Now, the preceding overview of Zenga's history brings us full circle and helps to situate the Gitter Yellen collection in historical context. As recounted in his memoir, Kurt Gitter first encountered a Sengai painting during his stay in Kyushu during the years 1963 to 65 as a flight surgeon in the US Air Force stationed at Hakata Air Base near Fukuoka. By this time, Sengai was a regional cultural hero, well represented in local collections, and was in the midst of being introduced to audiences abroad through the, a series of Sengai exhibitions we discussed earlier. Thus, the collection has its roots in conditions that are both personal, and biographical, but also world historical. The encounter between Gitter and Sengai appears serendipitous, but ultimately it was framed by both the post-war Zenga boom and the pre-war embrace of Edo monk painters in Japan itself. From there, the collection would grow in subsequent decades to encompass important works by every major Zen monk painter in the Zenga count canon, including an astonishing 34 works by Hakuin himself. And it would serve as a forum for the introduction of monk painters previously little known or underappreciated. And many were introduced in a seminal exhibition organized at the New Orleans Museum of Art, Zenga and Nanga. One of the most important legacies of the Gitter Yellen collection lies in the role it's played in catalyzing new awareness and study of Zenga itself, both in and out of Japan. In collaboration with the educator and independent curator, Alice Yellen, a specialist in American self-taught artists, Gitter formed the Gitter Yellen Foundation to promote the study of Japanese art. And Gitter and Yellen have, been, have developed relationships with a coterie of scholars who've been at the forefront of shaping the understanding of Zenga, most notably Stephen Addis, Audrey Seo, John Stevens, and Yamashita Yuji. And it's notable that Yamashita Yuji organized an influential exhibition of Zenga from the Gitter Yellen collection in the year 2000, instigating a reevaluation of Zenga and of Hakuin in Japan, leading to heightened interest in, among, in, the art, uh, in the artist among academic art historians. And I should say that uh, in 2013, for the first time ever, a Hakuin painting was designated an important cultural property, 
probably in part as a result of the influence of this show. I'd like to conclude today's lecture with one final observation. Uh, the collection, two final observations. The collection is now an in inextricable part of the history of Zenga, and it will surely help author new chapters in, uh, to this history in the years to come. But the second is that when one reflects and looks back on Kurt Gitter's five decades plus of studying and living with Zenga, and after so much collecting, after so many exhibitions, so many publications, and so many visitors, it's fair to wonder just how much karmic merit has it accrued him? <laughs> well, I think you know the answer. Thank you very much. Okay. So a very warm welcome to Alice Yellen Gitter and Kurt Gitter, and an expression of gratitude for the exhibition, loaning these wonderful, important works to both the Houston Museum and to the Japan Society, and for coming on stage today and, and sharing with us their personal perspective, history, experiences with formulating this, this collection really as a part of your lives and sharing personal slides. So we thought we would uh, put this together. This is really a conversation that largely evolves with an ongoing dialogue with Yukio Lippet and the Gitters. I had the, the privilege and good fortune to be able to visit the Gitters a week ago and pull together some of these slides, but also I met them the first time when I was actually based in Keio University under Kawaii Masamoto sensei who's sitting here. Thank you so much for joining us today. And during that time, I met you all at this end. It was very influential to so many of us of this group and, and generations after. So we'll start with this, this example here, and maybe if either of you like to, uh, to talk about your, your impressions or feelings about this work. Um. It's a lovely work. The Roma from Behind, June, one of the great calligraphers of the Edo period, and uh, like his calligraphy particularly, that's a very nice work and I enjoy it. Just, just to sort of add on to that, when you say you enjoy it, it's not only visually enjoying, but you spend so much of your time hanging the, hanging the, pic, the paintings, rearranging them, curating them in your home. You know, my answer to that is, I have a big answer. I've had a great life. I've had a family. I've had two wives. I have five children. I have 11 grandchildren, and I have four or five great-grandchildren. And uh, my family is very, very, very important to me and always has been. I've also had a great career in medicine, a spectacular career. I was president of the Macula Society, an international organization worldwide. I was a retinal surgeon. I practiced for 50 years, and I was very successful at that, and that's the money from that practice is what purchased most of these paintings because I had no family income. I had no, no inheritance of any sort. And it has been an area of joy for me for these 50 years. So it's not just acquiring it, it's looking at it, changing the paintings that we hang up at the house, usually on a monthly or a bi-monthly basis. And that's the story. Can, can I interject here? Because I, I just want to, uh, Kurt, I know you love this painting, and I just wanted to, uh, the painting that was up uh, just before, and I just want to say how profound this work is because it's the back of Daruma to us. <laughs> and then the inscription says, I don't know, which is part of that conversation, right? It says, Emperor Wu says, who's this standing before me? I don't know. So you have your back to the viewer, and it says, I don't know. It's the ultimate negative painting with the ultimate negative response. Like, give us something to hang on to. Like, what is, this is acceptable as a subject of a painting, but that's precisely what's profound about it. So it's wonderful that you have actually more than one example in your collection. Now that you explained it, I like it even better. <laughs> I don't know, right? <laughs> None whatsoever. <laughs> so in preparing for this conversation, um, Alice and I especially were speaking often about trying to create a sense for you all of the world into which this collecting happened and the, the world that we can't really see anymore, but you have so many memories and images from those times, starting with your, 
early in, early uh, experiences in New York. Philip Perlstein and I, Philip died last year, in the last several months, at age 99. Philip and I have been friends for 60 some odd years, close friends. And early on in the 50s, and when I was going to medical school in, in New York, I met Philip. And he introduced me to a lot of what was going on in contemporary American art. We used to go to the Cedar Bar together. We used to go to his, one of his other clubs. I met artists like de Kooning, Klein, Motherwell, and many others. And I was particularly intrigued by the contemporary work of people like Klein and Motherwell and others. So that when I got to Japan, I didn't know I, I, I was already intrigued with art. I was already beginning to be an art collector, even in New York. When I got to Japan, I started going around and looking and learning, took photographs of everything, kept notes of everything, and uh, early on decided that I really liked this Zenga stuff. And I started to buy it at a time when it was reasonable, available, and in quantity. You know, I remember going to a dealer in Tokyo or Osaka, one of the Yamamoto people, and I said, do you have any Hakuin? Hakuin? Hyaku arimas. <laughs> Means I have a hundred. And he'd take out his henchmen and start hanging them up. Then you'd decide which one you like, and if you wanted to pay the money, you bought it. That's how it worked. <laughs> you make it sound so easy. <laughs> Well, it was very interesting. Yeah. It was very interesting. And the, and the dealers, the dealers at that time, there, there weren't that many Western collectors. There was John Powers. There was Peter Drucker. Joe Price was doing his own thing with Junkachu, but he wasn't really on the scene. And, uh, and later on, there were many others. And the dealers were really, really out to teach us as much as they could, and they did. They were really instructional, over and above just making money. So it was very nice, and strong relationships developed with many of those families, the, the Yanagi family, the Yabumoto family, the Mizutani family, the Maruis, Arimura, Tanaka, m and I'm sure I'm missing several others, but many, many, many wonderful friends that we had. And over the years, we've been back to Japan 40 times, and it, we wouldn't, we, we, every time we'd come back, we'd see the same people. All of them were friends, and, and, we'd, and a day didn't go by or a night didn't go by when we weren't with somebody. That's what it was like. Well, I'd like to say, oh, sorry. I thought Philip was still there. We'll bring him back. <laughs> I wanted to say something about Philip, that what Kurt just described is that uh, began, I think, with Philip Perlstein, and that a lot of what he described about the three things in his life, family, medicine, and art, and, is in the integration of it, and the long-term commitment to all of them, I think really can be seen in the relationship with Philip, because Philip, uh, he started very young with Philip, and Philip died, I guess, about a year ago, I can't remember now, and they talked all the time, he visited us, we went to museums together, or we visited him. He came to a Seder at our house maybe two years ago, um, and Kurt knew his family well, and to the degree that he once diagnosed looking at one of his kids, something that, an, an eye issue. Um, but I think that the long-term relationships that we've had have been a lot of what has, has I think, uh, glue, been the glue for everything here for us. Um, so it's always been very integrated and very integrated with family. But I will say the one thing about Philip, there was such a natural relationship between Kurt and all the dealers that I always thought was a lot of fun. And Philip himself was a wonderful uh, painter and art historian. Um, so he was a source of many, many wonderful conversations for us. Uh, it, it just, it's interesting because I, I didn't actually realize until I, I spoke to you both that Philip Perlstein essentially was one portal into the art world for you. You were already very, fam we're already kind of very familiar with the art world when you went to Japan 
and that allowed you to be that much more receptive to figures like Sengai. Um, and Kurt, you've often said that you know in your time in Kyushu uh, with the Air Force, that was uh, an important time when your Zenga interest was really catalyzed, and, and Sengai was your first famously your first uh, addition of Zenga to your collection. Could you say a little bit about what appealed to you about Sengai? Well, you know, Sengai lived right near us in Fukuoka. I mean, he, he wasn't alive, but uh, he was well known, and every little, every little antique shop had something by Sengai. So I bought one or two. I think the first one I ever bought I gave to New Orleans Museum of Art. I think it's in their permanent collection. And then years later, we bought this wonderful hand scroll that's in the show here that's, I think, the only hand scroll in the West by Sengai. So Sengai was, you know, joyous, uh, happy, and uh, more like for the people, local for the people, than deep religious thought. And as much as I love Zenga, I didn't understand all the things that the professor spoke about today and probably never will, but that didn't deter from my enjoyment of looking at the pieces and being able to make comparative judgments in my own mind, whether they were right or wrong, I made the judgments mm -hmm. as to what to acquire and what not to acquire. And they were based on what they looked like and what was available at the time, what we already had and how much it cost. And to that, <laughs> your excellent I, um, coming not only from the, the lifelong analysis of vision, but also your insight and your understanding of how to read paintings and to recognize the, the value of these paintings. I wanted to share this picture of you. Well, that picture is with me and Jack Doddick. Some of you may have had been lucky enough to have Jack as a cataract surgeon here in New York. He was the best. He retired past couple of years, but Jack and I and Larry Inuzzi and Howard Schatz, very, very close friends for the last 50, 60 years. And Jack was a particularly uh, wonderful cataract surgeon and chairman of the department at NYU. And he and I were been very, very close. And here we're looking at pictures of ultrasound of the eye which was a subject that I had interest in early on in my residency. In fact, I published the first book on ultrasound in ophthalmology when I was a resident. So I had research interests early on, and that was part of my, what, my, my wonderful career in medicine. Kurt, can I just ask, you're, you have a famous visual memory. You can look at a painting and know exactly when it was, when you purchased it, when you first saw it, who you were with, but there's also, uh, a story circulating that you can actually look at an ultrasound or a retinal scan or some other, and you know exactly the patient an to which, I, I, oh, an I had angiogram, a, I had thank a, you. I had a very big practice in New Orleans, not, not just local, but regional, and even many came from out of the country, and we'd go out for dinner, Alice and I, to a fancy restaurant like Galatoire's, and at least four or five people come over, and hi, Dr. Getter, hi, hi. I don't remember names. I didn't remember then, and I don't remember now. But I do remember what their eyes look like when I see them. <laughs> and I remember what we did or didn't do about them, and that's the truth. So the minute we, we go somewhere in a, in a museum reception or a co Jewish community reception or something we were involved in, somebody would say, hello, Dr. Gitter, and Kurt would say to me, I know them, who, I know them well, I know them from here, what's her name? And I tell them their name, he say, yeah, I can see exactly what they've been treated for for so long. He could look at them and he could remember what their whole eye history was. <laughs> so maybe this is partly why this painting resonates with you so well. It's one of my favorite paintings, maybe my favorite Hakuin of all. Two blind men crossing a bridge. Sort of feel like we're all, we're all crossing a bridge. We're all going through life trying to accomplish as much as we can in a positive way without falling off the bridge. So what a beautiful story and what a beautiful painting. Really fabulous, I love it. It's a great favorite and as we continue, we wanted to see about the groundbreaking studies that grew out of your collection. Well, Steve was a very close friend and uh, 
and we miss him. And he was a great, great teacher and a great professor and a great writer and a great musician. And he loved Japanese art. And he loved Zenga, he loved Nanga, he loved ceramics. He was himself a ceramic, ceramic producer. And uh, he and I did many trips to Japan together. And we'd spend many, many, many hours and days, I remember, with the Mizutani family, first Nizaburo and then Ishinosuke. And then later with Shoichiro, who was the head of Shukoto, the existing Mizutani. And in fact, when Sh Shoichiro got married at the Hotel Miyako many, many years ago, there were two gaijins, me and Steve. That's right. It was really something. So, Kurt, can I, can I jump in and ask, this is such an important uh, exhibition and catalog in the history of the study of, of Zenga, but one of the interesting things about it is it combines Zenga and Nanga. And just to explain, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with these categories, these are not actually two categories that are naturally paired. Uh, Zenga is Zenga. Nanga is by literati painters, and by definition, who are very erudite about uh, particularly Chinese poetry and Chinese texts. And, it's a comp and they're not usually by Zen monks, usually by, uh, by, by people of letters. And so their pairing here is actually very unorthodox for the time. How did that come about? It came about because it started with Zenga. And, uh, and as I was acquiring Zenga, a dealer would say, you want to see anything here by Taiga? I said, who's Taiga? And they show me some Taiga. Yeah, I like that. Show me that. And Busan. And that's, and that's how it happened. And uh, fortunately, Steve was around. New Orleans Museum openly helped to have that exhibition and catalog, which is sold out many, many, many decades ago, and traveled around the country successfully. Is it the case that, um, I mean, literati painting does have an amateurish uh, feel to it, so there, it purports to be amateur painters. Did you recognize the visual affinities, and was that what drew you to literati painters like, like Busong? Uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that, Kilo. I really don't. Well, we're wondering about also Alice's interest in um, the, the painting of the American South and the untrained artists and the connections. So perhaps that's some of the synergy that you found together in your exploration of art throughout your lives together. Well, we discovered um, a, an artist named Sister Gertrude Morgan at the New Orleans Museum of Art when a colleague of mine, um, Bill Fegley, did a small exhibition in a teeny room off the side. We happened to be in that room many, many years ago, often for a luncheon around another exhibition that I was involved in. And um, we both loved him, and Kurt, it loves, Kurt is a collector, and he really wanted to go see this artist. And we began a life of seeing, of spending every minute we had in our farm truck, going to small communities, seeing artists that most people didn't know where they lived. I would call other friends who were museum colleagues. That's how we found out a lot about these artists, because museum people in a, small, in a community know where other artists are that are not considered on, on the mainstream at all, and are of any importance often. And we learned about so many artists, and uh, we just made it our commitment to go and visit these artists. And we, got the we had the opportunity to meet people from such varied backgrounds that we would never have had access to before. Because self-taught artists are self-taught American Southern artists of that era, of the post-war era. Um, and were, were people, and to up to through the 20, probably most of our artists were born be around before 1945, a couple after. But they all lived in the country. They all basically lived off the land. They all had minimal economic resources. And what we shared was our love of art. And we found that we ha people were so excited that we loved what they were doing, that they welcomed us into our, their homes. So I, from many perspectives, number one is we just went and 
found out where things were and went because Kurt had a great sense of direction. Dealers never wanted to tell you where their sources were, so sometimes they would guide you there and we would follow them, but the minute they'd leave, Kurt could get back. So, so we... Can, can, I, can I interject for a second? Yeah. I want to make it a little clearer. Alice and I got married in 1986. In 1987, we bought a whole collection of Sister Gertrude Morgan, who happens to be a very important self-taught artist. And we began collecting outsider art, and we have a major collection of outsider art among the better ones in this country. And that has been going on since 1986 with Alice and I as equal partners because prior to our marriage, I never bought anything other than Japanese art and some early French art before, before I got married the first time. So that's just a historical point of view. And this is a picture of Mary T. Smith, an artist in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, who was a self-taught religious painter who used to sit outside her house and do these doodles and they were all based on Christ images and religious iconography. And the picture on the right is in Tesaito for those of you who travel to, Kyush to Kyoto looking at paintings. In that particular gallery you say, I want to see Hakuin. They go to the back, they see what they have and they put up whatever they have many of which are not right, you know. So Mary T. Smith, like many artists in her, in her time and place, made things in their yards. And in the South, people had a lot of land. And um, th just there was a lot of land and people were farmers. And she would make things and she would put them outside her house on display off of Route 61. So you could drive up there and you just find her space because along the fence there were lots of paintings just like this in large tin pieces um, that, uh, that, that were her work. So she had an outside display situation that she controlled. And that's what a lot of self-taught artists did. They had the concept of showing, but they're showing not necessarily for sale, sometimes for sale, but not necessarily. And then they would change their exhibition at times. Mm -hmm. And we knew where these artists were, and we made friendships with them. This particular artist, as you can see from her clothing, had an incredible sense of design. She would often wear these beautiful, colorful things. And then when you look very closely at them, they were made of rags that were kept together with pins. But from a distance, they were just so beautifully put together. It was quite amazing. It was a very amazing life experience um, to really learn that part of America and to see what, how wonderful Americans are. And most importantly, I think from self taught art, one learns the lesson that creativity comes from within and that creativity is a God-given, or however you want to view it, uh, gift um, that uh, is not necessarily a result of education. So when you today, when we started collecting these works and learning about these works, these artists weren't known. I became involved in the field. I did publish a book or two on the field. and um, Alice published a book called uh, Passion and Visions, Passion of, the American and Visions South. of the American South in 1992, which sold 10,000 copies and has been sold out for years. And uh, she was undoubtedly one of the important people in the field. I'd just like to say that some of these artists at that time, you go up and you say, Mary, can I buy that painting? Yeah, you can buy it, $100, $200, whatever you, they would say. you say, okay, and you'd buy it. A little painting by Mary T. Smith is now $20,000. So some of these artists have really shot through the roof, much more than Japanese art has. So when we started, say, in the 90s, my goal for that exhibition was to place it in major art museums, not in folk art museums, not in community art places, but in a place that was a bona fide, well-respected, um, historically respected art museum. And we did. And that alone was a major coup because the goal was to have it be seen as art. So that was in the 1990s. Within 20 years, when a lot of our artists, or even before, began to pass away, we would find full page obituaries in the New York Times on them. So that these artists have truly entered the artistic mainstream, and that's really been the journey that we've been on the whole time, from the very beginning 
until now to the point that you can see some of these in galleries, contemporary galleries, that, and the gallerists never mention that they're self-taught because they're, they think they're worth more money if they're just pure contemporary artists. So it's been a wonderful, very rich journey in art and a wonderful journey in um, loving and knowing a lot of, a lot of kinds of Americans we, with great skills and different views of life that we just, that welcomed us into their homes that we would have never had access to. And, and if I could just interject, it's, it's wonderfully uh, combined. It's, it's in fact not combined, but it's a c in a continuum with the self-taught artists of, of Japan, it seems. And when you visit your place on Bamboo Road, the art study center of the Gitter Yellen Foundation is like a portrait of your aesthetic of self-taught, of appreciation of self-taught artists from around the universe. Uh, really, so it's a really um, what should be a kind of a very contrastive uh, kind of pairing is actually seamlessly uh, integrated in the very environment you've constructed. I think it's really Thank really you. You, wonderful. You, you know what F Philip Perlstein used to say: "All artists are self-taught. All artists." Because to hear your own voice, you have to hear your own voice. You're, you're teaching yourself. And you're, you're teaching yourself. You can look at what others do and imitate it, but when you get to your own. But there are combinations based on things that you said. These artists are untrained uh, in relation to Zen. They did not belong to an, uh, the canon of American art. Um, so there are a lot of relationships intellectually. And last year, the Met had a big show of this, this kind of work. And it's happened in Philadelphia, Chicago, the West Coast, all over the country. So now it's now it's less available, more expensive, and going more and more into museums, both by purchase and by gift. And, and when I had the opportunity to visit with you, I went through many, many photo albums together. And what we found were, um, throughout the years of photographs, there was always integrated the artwork, the friendships, along with family birthday parties and other celebrations. And so I brought together these two um, slides, perhaps you would like to address them. And I, you may notice that I highlighted many Ks <laughs> and the, and the um, captions for the four Ks, although there are three, now there are four, right, Kurt, with you in there? Well, the, the, the three Ks and me made four, and we'd have a dinner together at least once on every trip that we went to Japan for the last many, many, many years. And all of these guys are very, very dear to me. And one of them is right here in the front row, Kawai san. We're so privileged to have him come here. He has a glorious history of what he's accomplished in all fields of Japanese art. But he has also accomplished so much here in New York with his many friendships and closeness to Murase and others. So we're privileged to have Kawai san come to this show. And Kobayashi. Kobayashi has been to our home maybe five or six times with his family. And Kono, not only three or four times, but his daughter came and spent a month with me and spent time at the hospital. She was, a, she was gonna be a urology resident and wanted to get an exposure in American hospitals, so we took her. But we missed to talk about Koichi, who we all miss terribly. Koichi is such a great boy. I've known him since he was a baby. And here he is with my little baby a long, long time ago. Koichi left us last year, age 52. Very sad, very prominent. And what he accomplished here in New York in exposing great Japanese art to museums and private collectors was really very important to the whole field. Don't you think, Kyo? Yes, absolutely. And looking at this photo, I these set of photos, I think about how uh, the um, interpersonal dynamics that play out in Japanese society are, they're not for everyone, but they really resonate with you and the way you interact with people. And it was your ability to uh, connect with these people that were such a, a, a big part of your love of Japanese culture, but also, of course, the building of the, of the collection. So we always have a lot of laughter, even though sometimes they can't, they speak broken English or little language, and he speaks his Very version. 
<laughs> it's wor it's wordless. Our, he can buy our Japanese. It. It's wordless <laughs> communication. I mean, it's it's <laughs> the really the, it's, it's the secret to world peace. I mean, it's wordless communication. When we look through the pictures, the, we're the amazing thing though, as bad as my Japanese is, I've never ha never had trouble consummating a deal once I wanted the object. <laughs> Our pictures are so filled with laughter and communication that we had so many pictures when Michelle was looking at them that were maybe not good photographs, but the, but the communication is so joyous there. And speaking of communication, we have a letter here that was sent from a student from a visit by Gakshuing to the, the Getter Yellen uh, Study Center. And this, this photograph was included in the letter. It really speaks from the heart and how important it was for the students to look at the photograph, to spend time with the works, examine them in detail, up close, to live with them. And what generosity that you made this possible, not only from students from Japan, but also with students from the United States. And the photograph here is with, with Yukio Lippet, with his students from Harvard, and over here. One of them's looking at their phone. <laughs> 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 And Andy Watsky with his students from Princeton, and we'll hear from Andy later this afternoon. Well, we were privileged to have the Harvard group and the Princeton group and several other groups over the years. Columbia came down once or twice. Freer Gallery came down with their, with their board several times. But I think in the recent years, it's mostly Keo and, uh, and, the, and the Princeton group. If, if I could just interject here, one of the things that's really interesting about these visits, and we'll hear more later, is that you take s students and, you know, we're talking about the, the you know, w we're listing the death dates of the empresses of Japan or saying something really pedantic, but, but Kurt and Alice are always there for the entirety of our viewing sessions listening and absorbing and occasionally chiming in and providing information as uh, necessary, but they're, they're very much there and very much attentive and very much want to be part of the session. So, so these aren't sessions where we're just having a, a classroom, but we're really, really integrating with you, I think, when we're, so. we're there. Um, so it's pretty, and occasionally silently looking at each other and bursting out in laughter. <laughs> <laughs> This touches on what, what you were speaking about, Keo, about the return here. So you can see the, the image of the family in front of the exhibition opening and the catalog. And uh, thank you so much, Alice, for also putting this together with the, the extraordinary number of, of volumes and important groundbreaking breaking exhibitions by date. You can see the, the range of dates here. And just to go back to what Keo was talking about, Zenga, the return from America, it really is an insult if you think about it, the way in which you, you brought these, photo these paintings and works of art from Japan to America, and then back to Japan, and then back to America. I think Yuji Yamashita, who introduced the work back in Japan, had a big impact on changing the entire look of Japanese scholarship to Z Zenga of the Edo period. Is that true, Kyo? Yes, I, I think, I think uh, certainly Yamashita and, and that exhibition set off what, what we call a, a hakuin boom. Now the word boom or bumu is overused in, in Japan. Everything's a bumu, yeah. but, but this, is a gen this is an authentic bumu. And, and the, you know, since then there have been many uh, retrospectives of of Hakuin, and he's been, uh, it's the, the artistry of the artlessness of Zenga was, I think, really acknowledged with, with this show. So I, I consider it a, a, a really major show in Start Off the Century. And before we conclude, we wanted to show this list of the, the Gitter Yellen gifts to many selective and very important institution, institutions. And um, maybe, Kiel, uh, you may want to address the, <laughs> the juxtaposition here and the idea of, of handing down certificates and passing the gifts along to others. Well, it, yes, thank you. It, it, the, the staff is a symbol of Dharma successorship in Buddhism along with the robe and the alms bowl. And so I, I, 
one of the reasons why the Hakuin's famous dragon staff painting is chosen for the banner here is, I think, because it is meant to kind of uh, try, try to convey something of the essence of Zenga to a larger public. And this painting is, is by Hakuin is so profound because we actually know the name of the recipient. Someone named Nomura Magobe received it in the Hodek era, 1762, on the Buddha's birthday, as Hokuin writes, the eighth day of the fourth month. And what he writes in the uh, inscription there is that Nomura, our friend Nomura Magobe, uh, now can hear the sound of one hand clapping. <laughs> Which is a famous, which is a, the famous koan by Hakuin. What is the sound of one hand clapping? It's nonsensical. You can't hear it. Nobura Magobe can hear that, so he's received this painting as a symbol of his entry into the Dharma community of Hakuin. And that staff, if you look at it, it's a fly whisk. It's a symbol of Zen meditation hung from the jaw of the dragon at the head of. But it's it's a visual pun. It's also the gray beard of a venerable monk which is both Hakuin and what Nomura Magobe might become. So it's, a, it's an absolutely delightful painting paired with one of the great Nantembo staff paintings in the collection, which is just a, a very, uh, it's action painting before action painting, right? It's a, it's, it's a public Zenga exhibition, but it's not meant to be legible to the international avant-garde languages of visual modernism yet. That comes later on and we read that into it, but at the time, it's meant to be an extension of Hakuin's practice, of Zenga. The staff is an important uh, message. So, so it's really in between and mediating the post-war Western uh, embrace of Zenga and what Zenga means in Japan itself. And I think that's a lot of the work that the collection does, is it kind of mediates these two, two worlds. Yeah, so I think those two staffs are really nice bookends to the exhibition for that reason. I'd like to say one other thing. Th this list of museums, uh, some some of these places got one or two pla one or two things. Some of these places got 20, 30, 50. Some places got hundreds. And we've given away more than 500 objects in Japanese art. And we intend to give more away if we can over the next few years. And it's been a privilege for us to do this and expose the paintings that we've loved to a greater audience that might become appreciative of it and appreciate the close relationship between the United States and Japan, which has been a remarkable closeness since World War II. And uh, I've always felt very, very comfortable and at home in Japan with very few places. If I speak the language better, I probably would have bought a place there, but my language was never good enough. But anyhow, I, I thank you for this, and I, I think we're about finished. Yes, and this is leading <laughs> us into the second <laughs> half after our tea break. We will look at the institutional impact of this, these very generous gifts. Thank you for your time, and thank you so much for sharing with us today. <laughs> back everyone it's it's a second half is about to start and we have a very uh, a, a vibrant conversation that will build on what we began with this morning I'd like to for the sake of time introduce our entire panel first and then one by one each speaker will come and give an overview of the institution in which they are engaging with the Gitter Yellen collection and then we'll wrap it up with a conversation together and feel free to also engage in that conversation at the end so, so this panel is called The Gitter Yellen Collection of Japanese Art, Institutional Legacies, building upon what happens when the works move from a private collection into the public sphere. And our speakers come from both museums and from universities. We begin with Lisa Rondo McCord, who is the Deputy Director for Curatorial Affairs at the New Orleans Museum of Art. Next will be Dr. Andrew Watsky, the PY and Kimmei W. Tang officer, a, a professor of Japanese art at Princeton University, followed by Dr. Bradley Bailey, the Ting Sung and Wei Fong Chao 
a curator of Asian art at the Museum of Fine Arts of Houston. And I'd like to mention also that Bradley was the curator for the first iteration of this exhibition at the Houston Museum before it toured. And he worked in collaboration with Keo Lippett and also with Tiffany Lambert. Next uh, on our panel is Tiffany Lambert, who is the curator of the exhibition at the Japan Society Gallery right here. So thank you very much, and we'll begin with Lisa. Uh, so um, I'm delighted to be here today to speak about the remarkable legacy um, and the continuing impact of the Gitters at the New Orleans Museum of Art. Uh, the Gitters have not only been the prime movers behind the foundation and development of Noma's Japanese Edo period painting collection, but by extension, they have been instrumental in the transformation of an institution, having an impact that not, not only on the institution's overall collecting strategy and exhibition program, but also on its educational and programmatic activities and even its building program. Uh, as you've heard, the Gitter Collection began to form in the 1960s when Kurt and his family were in Japan. And it was late in that decade when they moved to New Orleans. And shortly thereafter, in 1971, there was an exhibition at NOMA entitled New Orleans Collect, Collects, an exhibition I have to say that Kurt totally forgot about. Um, <laughs> and it featured 11 loans uh, from the collection, including this uh, Kanetsune Nobu rural occupations, a detail of which is on the screen. Uh, and the exhibi exhibition, of course, sought to celebrate both established and emerging collectors uh, in the community. And the early 70s was really a remarkable time uh, for the New Orleans Museum of Art, where there was a convergence of compatible personalities and the recognition of remarkable opportunities. John Bullard uh, arrived at NOMA as the new director in the early 1970s with a mandate to further build the institution's collections and diversify its exhibition program. Recognizing the opportunities presented by the presence of a passionate collector in a relatively undervalued field, John committed substantial personal and institutional resources. These are financial, programmatic, um, et cetera, um, to the building and exhibition of uh, Edo period painting. And the collection of Japanese painting prior to John's arrival had fewer than 10 works. And I also must comment on his uh, ability, his persuasive abilities, in that he must have encouraged the Gitters to donate many of the works that had been exhibited in New Orleans Collects uh, as this Tsune Nobu came into our collection in 1974. By the mid-1970s, Noma's board had adopted a new collections policy, one that included the collection of Edo period painting as a collection priority. And this is a policy that still stands. In the early decades of building Noma's collection, the Gitters included John on their buying trips. And John and Kurt bought both independently, of course, and complementarily. And not surprisingly, in the early decades, Noma's collection paralleled uh, that in its focus uh, as to the Gitter collection. And uh, particularly in the acquisition of Zenga and Nanga paintings, um, as uh, one could see in the 1976 um, Japanese Zenga and Nanga paintings by Japanese monks and scholars. Over time, the collection widened and broadened its scope, as did the Gitter collection, of course, to include artists uh, of many other schools and traditions in an effort to bring our audiences in New Orleans and the region a broader understanding of Edo painting. So NOMA, whoops, NOMA has either uh, curated, organized, or otherwise shepherded 10 exhibitions. Uh, you saw the covers of many of them in one of the slides in Kurt and Alice's presentation, um, as well as um, dozens upon dozens of um, exhibitions and installations within our permanent collection uh, galleries. And all of these, of course, have focused either primarily or at least in part um, on the Gitter collection and significant loans um, from that collection. And these projects brought the curatorial expertise of numerous scholars, particularly Stephen Addis, as you've heard, who curated many of the exhibitions 
uh, beginning in the late 1970s through the 90s, as well as scholars such as Pat Pfister, Don Wood, Tadashi Kobayashi, Joe Earl, Audrey Sio, and many, many others, uh, each of whom brought their scholarly expertise to bear on the collections and also introduced their students and graduate students uh, to the collection, continuing the impact and ensuring uh, an enduring legacy. Accompanying these exhibitions and installations, there have been consistent and continual educational and public program initiatives that have ranged from, of course, the standard annual docent training to guest lectures, university classes held at NOMA, uh, colloquia and international symposia accompanying the major exhibitions of the Gitter Collection. One such program, which is now known as Japan Fest, demonstrates the extraordinary public and community impact this collection has had. Japan Fest has been uh, held for over 30 years with an annual attendance of over 4,000 people who come to celebrate the culture and arts of Japan, all focused, of course, and instigated uh, by our Edo period painting collection. For several decades, the Japanese collection was exhibited in various galleries throughout the museum. Uh, in the early 90s, there was an expansion program, and it provided the first opportunity for the New Orleans Museum of Art to create dedicated galleries uh, to Japanese painting and ceramics. And there have been regular exhibitions and installations in this space since that time. Today, our collection, of course, numbers in the hundreds, with hundreds donated uh, to the New Orleans Museum of Art by the Gitter, and scores more Gitters, excuse me, um, and scores more that have been facilitated uh, by Kurt and works given in honor uh, of him. And it is no exaggeration for us to say that without the Gitter's commitment to New Orleans and the building of a collection at NOMA and the passion and enthusiasm that they shared with NOMA's leadership, there would be no collection of Edo period painting at NOMA at all. Uh, and the New Orleans Museum of Art uh, is delighted that this May, we will be naming the Japanese gallery in honor of the Gitters and featuring in 24 and 25, a series of exhibitions celebrating the collection that they helped to found. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Andy Watsky, and I teach uh, Japanese art history at Princeton University. So I'm here to talk about the ways in which um, uh, we at Princeton, in a collaborative way, have worked very closely uh, with Alice and Kurt over the years and the kinds of things that we've been doing. Um, but first of all, let me just say that uh, this is really a celebration. Uh, congratulations on this exhibition. Um, welcome to Michelle. I'm so glad that you're here now. And again, I'm going to just speak about the uh, long-term engagement between Princeton and uh, the Gitter Yellen Collection. Um, one of the things that we do, uh, or that we've been doing, is going down to New Orleans um, with graduate students and uh, always with uh, two of the Princeton University Art Museum curators um, and experience the art in person. Um, it's very important to us that this is part of our program or it's become part of our program because of the generosity uh, of Kurt and Alice in which we really are trying to train that next generation of scholars at looking and thinking and curating uh, works of art um, and what you see here is the inside of the building that Keo showed us, I believe it was in uh, one of the lectures that we've heard, uh, the outside of the Art Study Center. Uh, this is what it is inside. Um, and we have gone down uh, three times uh, in the past 10 years or so uh, with groups of students and again with the curators um, studying objects uh, in person um, as a group. And you'll see that 
a lot of the time is spent uh, in this picture with Alice, but also with Kurt, uh, looking at works of art. Now, this is not just fun and games. Um, before we go down, if we're going to be taking them to New Orleans for a few days, they have to work a little bit. Uh, they do have an assignment. And the assignment that I have tended to give to the students, um, and it varies from time to time, um, but basically it does have something to do with what we might be studying in class, in seminar, um, but I ask the students to, in a sense, curate mini exhibitions, to choose select objects from the collection, uh, maybe 13, 14, 15 works, um, and group them into um, smaller groups. In other words, curate small exhibitions. Um, and then be ready to talk about them, why they selected those works, why they're putting them together. Um, and one of the things that has occupied us these, on these visits uh, certainly has been Zenga. But what I'm going to focus on uh, right now are looking at other aspects uh, of the collection, which shows, uh, I think, that there are just incredible strengths and diversity in the collection uh, that have been very helpful for us. Um, one of the other things that's very important when we go down there um, is that the students learn how to handle works of art. Uh, the curators are very careful about training how to properly handle objects, again, with very close supervision of the curators. Um, but all of the students are getting hands-on experience um, of how to work with art. Now, one of the things that strikes me about this experience uh, for them that's been so meaningful, um, but then coming to this exhibition and seeing it, is that one of the pleasures of going down to New Orleans and working at the Art Center, as you can see, um, that the paintings themselves are not behind glass. And I think one of the really wonderful things about this exhibition uh, is how you can see the works of art up close, uh, without glass and any sort of reflection, um, I don't think that they would like it very much if you did what my students are doing uh, in this picture. You know, you're not supposed to unroll them and roll them, but um, it is a real treat to be able to th see things uh, up close and, and personal. Um, we do have a lot of fun. Uh, it's immensely enjoyable. Look at all the smiles. Um, and this comes after several days of morning to night working um, with the objects, but it's immensely uh, fulfilling. And of course, one does have to eat. Um, and that's been one of the other aspects of our trips down to New Orleans. Um, but it's not just eating good food, although that's certainly part of it. We are there morning to night. We all you know, go to sleep in our, in our separate rooms, but we're, we're, in the waking hours, we're together the whole time. So whether it's over a meal, whether it's over coffee, whether it's over drinks before dinner, um, we are talking about art surrounded by art. And that's one of the fantastic things about being down in New Orleans, is understanding that the art is not just in the art center. It's all around the house. Um, and living with it is a very, very important aspect um, uh, for, uh, for the Gitters, for sure, but also for us who have the uh, pleasure to go down and visit them. Now, one of the other aspects of our relationship um, has been uh, to do an exhibition. Uh, and this exhibition took place in 2018, 2019, in my mind, pre-pandemic. Um, and it was one of the last, well, it was the last exhibition that I was involved with at the museum uh, before the pandemic. Um, and this exhibition, called Picturing Place in Japan, uh, was based on really the findings of those first two visits down to New Orleans with the students. Uh, as I said, they were kind of curating mini exhibitions, and because we were working a lot with paintings of landscapes and seminar, um, I think students naturally gravitated to that, but we found real density and, and real uh, importance of seeing all of these works together, but it really came together, I think, very organically that we wanted to do an exhibition of these paintings that we had been studying so closely down in New Orleans, uh, up in Princeton. 
and uh, with the generosity of, of Kurt and Alice, we were allowed to do so, and uh, so the exhibition opened. Um, and what the exhibition did was it combined uh, works from the Gitter Yelling collection with works from the Princeton University Art Museum collection, um, which was a fantastic opportunity, uh, certainly for Princeton and the broad community within Princeton, but it really worked very well for me as well as a teacher. Um, I taught a freshman seminar in the fall of 2018. The seminar actually began before the exhibition opened so that we could study the works of art before they were installed into the galleries. And we were studying works in, uh, in storage, again, seeing them not behind glass. Um, and uh, it was a fantastic opportunity. Um, I also taught a graduate seminar in the spring. We were, luckily, the, the exhibition spanned uh, two semesters, so that when I taught my graduate seminar that spring, um, the students who uh, were in that seminar could actually study the works. And it was wonderful that some of those students uh, that saw the exhibition and were involved with the exhibition, in fact, the co-curator co -curator of the exhibition, uh, Caitlin Cariotti, was one of my graduate students. And of course, she had been one of those students who'd gone down to New Orleans um, and was part of the process of, um, of the gestation of, of this exhibition. Um, so it was just a wonderful teaching opportunity. The freshman seminar, of course, were all freshmen. These are students who were brand new to Princeton uh, I would say that very few of them, if any of, well, no, one, in, one did certainly know quite a bit about Japan, but most of them didn't. And so their introduction to Japan and to the Japanese landscape really was through uh, these paintings. And it was a wonderful uh, seminar. Um, there were three galleries, and it was in the old museum. The reason I haven't shown you a picture of the Princeton University Art Museum is because it right now is a construction site. Uh, we have knocked down the old museum and we're in the midst of building a new one. Um, it should be open about a year from now and we will see how that goes. Um, so there were three galleries in the, uh, in the museum for this exhibition. Uh, each room was anchored by a major large scale painting from the Gitter Yelling collection. Uh, as you see here, uh, Ike no Taiga, and each room had its own focus. Um, we also included works from the Gitter Yelling collection that, the, that have entered uh, Princeton's permanent holdings as gifts, which we are very, very grateful for. Um, and here uh, in the middle of the paint, uh, in the middle of the slide, you can see a painting by Taiga and then a pair of paintings by Sakai Hoitsu. Thank you very much. They're important parts of our permanent collection along with other works that we have received. Now, the uh, exhibition provided an ideal viewing condition with perfect lighting uh, and viewing lines, of course. This particular painting, this pair of screens by Tani Buncho, uh, were at the entrance of the exhibition. And uh, the earlier slide that I showed was looking into the exhibition um, and indeed, this painting was so powerful, it really drew people into the show uh, from the hallways of the museum. And people stopped uh, in their tracks in front of this painting and spent uh, lots of time uh, looking at this pair of screens. Um, obviously, they're monumental. Uh, it's a tour de force of brushwork, um, the glowing gold leaf. These are paintings that really stood out in the exhibition and uh, people certainly gravitated towards them. But the reason they were at the exhibition, in part, had to do with the fact that they were also major works of art that the grad students uh, encountered when we went down to New Orleans. Each of the three groups, uh, without my saying anything, um, selected this work as one of the things they wanted to, wanted to see. And at the Art Study Center, we uh, there is this wonderful a space dedicated for large-scale works. Um, somehow these screens always ended up uh, in that space and stayed up there, even though we occasionally rotated other paintings 
uh, behind it, or, well, we would take these down first, of course. Um, but these always went back up. And one of the things that the students said to me about this painting, uh, and it was more than one, uh, was they, living, they were living with this painting in a way. One of the great aspects of going down to New Orleans um, was that the students themselves actually stayed overnight in rooms in the Art Study Center. So at that point, uh, the, the teacher and the curators were off elsewhere. Um, the students were on their own. And one of the things that they said to me was waking up in the morning and seeing this pair of screens in the morning light was an entirely different experience than seeing it during the day or seeing it in the evening when they were, I'm sure, just drinking tea. Um, but having the screens with them the whole time was very, very important. And that experience of learning what it's like to live with art, even if it's only a few days, um, was, I think, a very powerful thing for the students. I'd like to end um, with just a thought um, that was sparked by this hoax I print from the series 36 Views of Mount Fuji. This is not from the Gitter Yellen collection. Uh, it is a print that's in the uh, Princeton University Art Museum. And just this past Monday, um, I was teaching my undergrad seminar in Japanese prints, and we went to the temporary museum study room on campus. Again, the museum is not there, but we have a room that we can go and conduct our seminar with objects from the museum. Um, and as we were talking about this print, and we talked about it for quite a while, one of the ideas that the students landed on was what this print does is thematize the act of viewing. It's about looking, and Mount Fuji happens to be the object of the viewing here, um, but this idea of creating a composition in which all of the figures are viewed from the back, intensely looking at an object, reminded me as I was going through and uh, looking at all of my images from these visits down to New Orleans, um, I came across this picture, um, which seems to me channels that same kind of activity with a similar sort of focused yet relaxed intensity of just looking, spending time looking at objects, looking at Mount Fuji, but really taking the time slowly to look, to talk, to uh, try and understand the works and bring them together um, in some sort of uh, a way of understanding them. I would say that uh, our efforts in this area have been very successful. I think you have helped to train a whole group of graduate students who are going to be the future of the field. Um, so I thank Kurt and Alice and, and Manya uh, for your hospitality and for allowing us to be part of your wonderful, um, um, your wonderful work that you do down in New Orleans. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. Um, in the interest of time, I'll try to be, to be brief. Um, I work at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. If you have not visited us, please do. Across a 40-acre campus, we have now with our new Rich Kinder Building, um, Nancy Rich Kinder Building, I believe over 400,000 square feet of exhibition space. Um, we also have two house museums that are not part of this presentation. But the reason I wanted to show you all three of these buildings, which um, incidentally, they are all connected by underground tunnels, so you don't have to walk uh, city blocks, at least above ground between them, uh, is that the, the Gitters and their collection have actually touched all three of these buildings. Um, the Beck Building is dedicated primarily to European and American art, as well as our neoclassical collection, or our antiquities collection, rather. Um, however, uh, with the Zen Show at Houston, uh, in an unprecedented, the only other time that Asian art has been shown in that building uh, was a special loan from the National Palace Museum. So that's the level of... of uh, gravitas that the Gitter Yellen collection uh, brings and, and the level of um, how significant we felt it was for the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, but I will say we have shown their work in our Japanese galleries in the law building as well as our special exhibition spaces in the law building and um, even the, uh, the, the collection of American art that Kurt and Alice have also given to the museum is now on view in our Kinder building which is dedicated to global art of the 20 and 21st centuries.
Their relationship uh, with Houston began actually prior to my arrival. You can see here an installation shot. Of, this is in that law building. Um, this this uh, unfolding worlds occupied, I believe, 25,000 square feet of gallery space uh, in the Caroline Weiss Law Building. And here you can see a wonderful pair of Yamamoto Baitsu Four Seasons screens, probably from the 1830s, that are now, now part of the museum's collection, thanks to Curtin Alice. Um, and behind them you can see, uh, I believe, a Hochu and I think a Chobuntoku, I believe. Um, but these are also signature works from the, the Gitter Yellen collection. And as I mentioned, it is now part of our permanent collection. Uh, I believe it's now two or three years ago now, but uh, we completed a historic gift purchase agreement with the Gitter Yellens that brought, I believe, 78 uh, different works of Japanese art to the museum's permanent collection, including works by Baitsu, Jakuchu, Sotatsu, Hakuin, of course, uh, Nakamura Hochu, uh, Kami Sakasaka, and many, many, many others. It was also the subject of an article, which you can read about uh, in Arts of Asia magazine, and, in, and indeed these Baitsu screens were the cover of the Arts of Asia issue. Here's another work that is now uh, in the Houston Permanent Collection in Iroha by Nakahara Nantembo, which was also featured in the Zen show. But if you look closely in the background, you'll see the Suda Kokuta tea screen, which is currently on view here. And in addition to the beautiful screens uh, shown in the show in 2014 or 2015, uh, we also borrowed extensively from the, their collection of ceramics, as you can see here with the Kishi Eiko. However, uh, more recently, uh, just last year, we showed an iteration of this show, the first iteration of this show in our Beck building, as I mentioned. It was a much larger iteration with, I, th I think the checklist included about 150 to 160 total works. Um, and as you can see here, we replicated, this was very, very popular with, with, with all of our, uh, with, well, hopefully with Curtin Alice, but definitely with the, the general public, um, being able to look at the, these blind men crossing the log bridge in, in this, vast, almost history, history uh, painting level scale was very, very exciting. Um, the show, as I said, contained um, many, many more works than, than um, can be accommodated here at Japan Society, but you may notice a few of the, the repetitions, especially here in the Hakuin section. Um, these, of course, are the Yama Okateshu uh, Iroha screens, which you can also see upstairs, which were in a kind of more expanded uh, meditation, I guess you could say, on um, on the followers of Hakuin, which are, of course, very, very well represented in Curtin Alice's collection. And if you're curious about the entire checklist, the, uh, the museum, we published um, an online e-catalog, which is available for free right now um, on your phone. The None Whatsoever at Houston culminated with a final room, which really emphasized, uh, at least I was trying to emphasize both Zenga and Zen's contribution to modernism, principally through people like Shaku Soen and D.T. Suzuki, but also to, again, come full circle, um, and including artists such as Robert Motherwell or Mark Toby. I borrowed works from um, our permanent collection as well as the Menil collection in Houston to supplement this area, um, and putting them next to works from the Gitter Yellen collection, like the Munakata Shiko you see there. This was really my attempt, in addition to telling the, the story of Zen's contribution to modernism, also to highlight uh, kind of the origin stories of the Gitter Yellen collection with Kurt's initial encounter with abstract expressionism in New York in, in the mid-century. Um, but it was a wonderful, wonderful privilege to be able to show um, all of these works in Houston. Uh, I believe it was the largest Zenga show ever. Um, and it's wonderful to see them here back at Japan Society and to know that many, many important works from this show, as well as Many others that I don't have time to show you are now part of Houston's permanent collection, thanks to Kurt and Alice. Uh, here are a few examples from the show, but I wanted to conclude with uh, a couple that you may not have noticed, but that are, that are indeed now part of uh, Houston's permanent collection. One is this ant on a stone mill painting, one of my personal favorites, both for the soft treatment of the ink in the, the stone mill, but also for the use of this wonderful quotidian object. Um, and an ant, you know, it basically says, the ant on the stone mill is a, is a hint for this world or something. Basically, if you were to ask this ant how long he's been walking, he would swear he's been walking for days. But with our point of view, of course, we can see the futility of his actions. And I think this really encapsulates um, kind of the first room of the show, and it's wonderful now that this, such an important painting, is part of our permanent collection. And to try and entice you to Houston, I wanted to include one painting which we were not able to include in the show, but which was a gift of Curtin Alice a very, very beautiful and important and rare uh, work by So Tatsu. Again, showing artists, professionally trained artists outside of the traditional um, Zenga canon were actually engaging 
with this material. And in particular, I love this, this one because one of the other strengths, in addition to Zenga, in Kurt's collection, of course, is Rimpa, um, especially Kami Sakaseka. And I think there's something about the kind of decorative distortion of the monk Bukhan's face, especially in the center, and the sweet, the sweet face of the, um, the tiger that resemble the work of Kami Sakaseka, you know, hundreds of years later. So this is now one of the signature pieces of the MFAH's Japanese painting collection. Uh, thanks very, very much to entirely indeed to Kurt and Alice. So thank you, thank you both. And it's a privilege to be able to exhibit these works here, but also to keep them uh, in perpetuity at Houston. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. says who we are. Okay, great. I'm delighted to be here with you today um, to join in the enriching conversations already underway. So thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Tiffany Lambert. And I'm curator of Japan Society Gallery. Since the Japan Society Gallery opened in 1971 with the first exhibition by Rand Castile of Rimpa Masterworks, speaking of Rimpa, um, of the Edo period, it has been one of the world's foremost spaces dedicated to showcasing the very best of Japanese art. From Nipponto art swords of Japan to imperial treasures to no masks and robes to early video sculptures by Shigeko Kubota. Japan Society Gallery has been a place to share with our audiences all the arts of Japan and the Japanese diaspora and an array of artistic mediums from the ancient to contemporary. This has included graphic prints by the Japanese American artist Kyohei Inukai, the world's first institutional survey of the um, incredible polymath Kazuko Miyamoto, and the convention defying Shiko Munakata's dynamic Buddhas, pan-Asian deities, prismatic landscapes, and fanciful natural motifs. Um, historically, we've also gone outside of the gallery walls. This is a, a runway show by the Art and Fashion Collective Concept Foreign Garments New York, or, or CFGNY, um, who presented their new collection in a fashion show in our lobby uh, one year ago, almost to the date, um, in conjunction with a, a two artist exhibition in our gallery. Um, the runway presentation was uh, an homage to a 1971 um, show, which is when Japan Society held the first fashion show of a, little, a then little known fashion designer, um, Issey Miyake. <laughs> Japan Society Gallery has a storied legacy, which some of you are obviously very aware of, um, and it's one that I am both energized and, and honored to contribute to as curator. As many of you also know very well, Japan Society Gallery has a long history with Zen-related topics, Zenga as well as the Gitter Yellen collection. In 2010, we held a major exhibition on the most important Zen master, Hakuin Ikaku, whose influence in both teaching and art remains unrivaled today. It was the first exhibition in the Western world on Hakuin, um, and it featured 70 of his scrolls, along with 10 scrolls by his major disciples, and was assembled from both public and private Japanese and American collections. The Gitter Yellen collection, as one of the world's most important and impressive collections of Zenga, um, among other things, uh, was of course a crucial part of this exhibition. Um, and some of those works are returning to us today and none whatsoever, Zen paintings from the Gitter Yellen collection, um, which is on view upstairs if you haven't been already. I urge you to go. <laughs> um, in honor of its 100th anniversary, Japan Society presented Awakenings, Zen figure painting in medieval Japan. The exhibition drew on an assemblage of rare loans and precious cultural treasures to explore the history and uses of figural painting within the Zen tradition. Um, the result of extensive scholarship on the subject, including um, by Dr. Yukio Lippitt, Awakenings marks the first examination of this genre in a US museum. And the gallery looks a bit different today. <laughs> it was fun to see this, <laughs> which is the uh, entrance now. Um, so these are just two examples of Japan Society's tradition of presenting important Buddhist art exhibitions. Um, others have included transmitting the forms of divinity, early Buddhist art from Korea and Japan from 2003, Enlightenment Embodied, the art of the Buddhist sculptor from 1997, Visions of the Dharma, 
Japanese Buddhist painting and prints in the Honolulu Academy of Arts from 1993, The Great Age of Japanese Buddhist Sculpture, 1983, and Horyuji Temple of the Exalted Law, Early Buddhist Art from Japan, 1981. Um, additionally, the Gitter Yellen collection has been featured in exhibitions at Japan Society, uh, including in an enduring vision, 17th to 20th century Japanese painting from the Gitter Yellen collection in 2004, and the art of 20th century Zen, paintings and calligraphy by Japanese master, 1998. Um, so we couldn't be more delighted to once again have the Gitter Yellen collection return to our gallery. As many of you have likely seen um, in our galleries upstairs, um, our new exhibition, uh, Traveling from the MFA Houston, None Whatsoever, features 53 works from, from the Gitter Yellen collection and the MFA Houston collection as well. I believe seven of those 53 are from the MFA. Um, it is a rare chance to view this number of important works, including 20 scrolls by Hakuin um, in a dedicated gallery, as well as Sengai's only known scroll, as um, Dr. Lippitt discussed earlier, along with other fine examples um, by monk painters from the late 1600s into the 20th century. Uh, a truly wonderful Enso, uh, which we also saw earlier, so I'll just skip ahead, um, by Tore and Ji. Um, and so I just want to end in the, in this, uh, for the sake of timing as well um, with just a few process images um, of the exhibition here in, in our iteration. Um, for Japan Society's version of this exhibition, we not only adapted the, the number and the layout of the paintings to best suit um, our space, uh, but we also introduced um, newly commissioned graphic and exhibition design that took the concept of the exhibition and the artworks as their inspiration. Um, the exhibition didactics, for example, um, were inspired by the scrolls in their elongated format, which is um, actually silk screened, um, ink silk screened onto paper, um, and then the designers pasted it onto the wall, like a wallpaper, essentially. Um, so some shots of it with the laser getting it all level. <laughs> Um, so, in essence, they were attempting to achieve this kind of inky, smudged aesthetic that um, wasn't very much inspired by the paintings. Um, the exhibition design itself uh, really emphasizes the paintings as well, um, in my view, while functioning to delineate the space where visitors can and cannot walk, therefore protecting the space in a simple gesture. So this is um, the last gallery prior to the installation. Um, and this is, this is the installation shot of it after showing kind of the final outcome. So it was just a simple carpet that we installed um, with the focus really squarely where it should be on, on the art. Um, so I hope you enjoy the exhibition. I look forward to speaking more about um, all of these wonderful ideas with the rest of the group. Thank you so much. Thank you each for sharing your perspectives on the ways in which the Gitter collection was very, very impactful and, and instrumental in both training and in learning and in understanding larger aspects of Zen and art overall. Um, in the spirit of Hakuin's dissemination of his paintings, I feel that your generosity has also greatly broadened um, people's access and understanding and ways of encountering the works of art. And all of these talks here underscore the way in which there's a, a dynamic between the works that you've created, that you've collected in your private collection into the public realm, going into dialogue with other works of art and developing other things. For example, the seed for a permanent collection at the New Orleans Museum or the, the training for young aspiring curators to actually take those works into the Princeton Museum of Art, or for an exhibition to be created in, in its one iteration and appear very differently and send different messages in the way it's been curated to New York here. Um, and so all of that sort of the, the intellectual and the aesthetic agility of what you have selected 
truly is expansive and very highly impactful. And for that, we're very, very grateful. And this will be continuing a legacy of Hakuin and all of the other Zen artists, monk painters that you have recognized so early on. Um, so I know that we're close to the end. That's just a sort of my impression from listening to you all. But I welcome our speakers to add to that. And we have time for one or two questions or comments as well. <laughs> Would you like to, anyone from the audience, this is a wonderful opportunity also with Alice and Kurt here to uh, share any of your perspectives or thoughts, comments. <laughs> no? So maybe what we should do then is to reflect upon all of this and take uh, a look at the galleries, if you would like to do that. I think there's so much that we've been thinking about today. We're very fortunate to have the curators here. Um, maybe for the next 30 minutes, they may still be willing to spend some time with us, and we can proceed to the galleries. Thank you so much, Alice and Kurt. We're very grateful for your contributions here. And thank you all. And thank you, Kiel. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lippitt. <laughs>